Time now for this week's Health Matters with PA Lynn Zabo. Uh, and uh, once again this week we're talking about uh, things that come along after COVID, because right. that's sort of where we are, yeah, I guess. We're really winding down. Hopefully. Yeah, we really are, right? So there, yeah. there's all kinds of lingering effects that you've talked about, long COVID and other other uh, chronic it, issues. Dysautonomia, yeah. Yes, exactly. Which I actually, uh, I've been talking with people outside about, hey, have you heard about this? The the, the last week's uh, Health Matters. Yeah, uh, that's the thing. The, uh, um, so mm. now it's, of course, everybody concerned about uh, uh, pulmonary health and uh, what COVID does to your lungs. Uh, and uh, there are steps you can take post-COVID to sort of uh, rehab yourself, yeah, correct? Yeah, ex- absolutely. What's that look like? And that's called pulmonary rehabilitation. So um, there's also there's a lot of um, images going around in the medical literature um, about what lungs look like after COVID and really high-resolution CT scans. Mm-hmm. And then also um, they look at the vasculature in lungs, and it's like... It's like horrific. Really? Yeah. So even people who have had a mild case can have a lot of um, residual damage to their lungs. Mm -hmm. And presumably that's going to be a problem throughout their life because the nature of that damage is pulmonary fibrosis. Okay. Okay. So pulmonary fibrosis is basically after somebody gets an, an assault or an injury to the lungs, it's scarring which impacts how a person breathes and how oxygen is transmitted across um, the lung tissue into the bloodstream. Okay. okay. I've always wondered about fibrosis because you see that word in so many different conditions and things going on. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's basically a buildup of scar tissue? Yeah, it's scar tissue and it kind of makes the, the tissue talking about because you can see fibrosis in skin. Mm-hmm. Scars are a good example of fibrosis. You, you can see it in liver. So somebody has cirrhosis. So it takes whatever tissue you're talking about from functional to kind of like shoe leather. Right, right. And therefore not functional. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So um, symptoms include persistent dry cough, um, fatigue, shortness of breath, um, and dyspnea. We call dyspnea, but dyspnea is kind of like when you're moving around, you're losing your breath. So shortness of breath is you're just sitting there not doing anything and your lungs can't keep up. Gotcha. Okay. So dyspnea is with movement. And sometimes you actually have to put people in oxygen. So the goal of pulmonary rehabilitation after COVID is to decrease all this and to increase exercise tolerance and improve quality of life. Okay. It doesn't really reverse the damage. Wow. So this is salvage. This isn't really necessarily improvement. You're not undoing anything. You're just learning how best to live with what's happened, right? But it also, since the lungs are kind of important to the rest of the body, it does, (laughs) if your lungs, you know, are kind of working a little better, um, then then the rest of your functioning is going to be better, especially anxiety, because we've talked about how primordial it is to not be able to breathe, mm-hmm. like what kind of terror that is mm-hmm. and how that would make people depressed because they can't move around like they used to, mm-hmm. and then also be anxious because they can't breathe. So, right, right, right. Yeah. And so, you, you know, if you're, <laughs> and with anxiety, one of the first things you do is slow yourself and breathe. Right. And if you're not getting the oxygen, if it's right. not, if it's just a muscle thing you're doing as opposed to actually taking a deep breath, then what's the point? So I was initially puzzled by this because mm-hmm. although respiratory rehabilitation is highly recommended post COVID, I can't think about whether it's really available here. I don't think I've ever seen anybody need recognized for it and okay. I, i'm not sure that we have a resource maybe i don't think out sutter does outpatient respiratory therapy it's so maybe but so let me let me understand then what happens in, in an examination room if somebody is post covid and you're going through this with it with the doctor here here in the u.s and uh, so this is never outlined these sort of steps i mean yeah, because people, you've got con- people talk about anxiety they talk about depression they talk about shortness of breath and and what they and if it's in the context of COVID, because sometimes that's not even recognized. Right. Okay. But if it's if that's recognized, then what you usually hear is, well, we don't know much about it. It's supposed to get better with time. But fibrosis isn't going to get better with time. Wow. Wow. Not okay. Unless you intervene in some way to try and preserve function as much as you can. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's not like fibrosis happens like in a second. It it's an evolving thing. Right, so right. Is there a possibility of stepping in and improving the picture so the person feels better, the person's more functional? Mm-hmm. I don't think that's happening here. 
So. Right, right. So what? So what happens in lieu of that? I, I think it's kind of like you know, you <laughs> just know, a shrug. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like supposed to get better with time. That's all. Huh. But so I was wondering specifically how it would get better with time. Uh-huh. Okay, because I'm reading all these articles in preparation for this that talks about all the damage that happens, how it appears in a patient, you know, what it looks like in in tissue. And then what theoretically should make it better? And they all say that that rehabilitation, respiratory rehabilitation is super important. And then it goes, the end. (laughs) And I'm like, well, how do I get my patients to that? Right, right. And um, especially because I'm not certain it's much of a resource here, um, even even in Humboldt County. Mm -hmm. So maybe at tertiary care centers they have it. But I was looking for something that that you could give the motivated patient exercises at home. So I went to YouTube. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I found lots of YouTube videos from other countries, Mm -hmm. mostly India, where they're public health people and they're like Surgeon General equivalents. Um, were <clears throat> fashioning this YouTube video for average Joe Indian um, to be able to do these really simple exercises at home. And they had data suggesting that this was improving people's outcomes. Wow. And I'm like, so why don't we do it here? So why don't we do it here? Or should we save that for the end? <laughs> anyway, I've got some ideas. Okay, but let me right. talk about the exercises. So let, yeah, let's go through the actual okay, exercises. Okay, so to anybody who wants to do these, these are all really simple, mm-hmm. okay? And they don't involve buying anything. And, um, you know, you could do it at home. So the first one is purse-lipped breathing. And they have weird names, okay, because they're coming from a mostly different culture. <laughs> but a purse-lipped breathing, I think of it as kind of yogic breathing, okay? So very simply, breathe in long and slowly through the nose mm-hmm. and then out through the mouth. But that's yoga breathing, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what I would call it. Right. Um, they want you to purse your lips a little bit, but I don't know. In my practice, I don't think it matters. But um, so my only, the only thing I can think of with that is is to increase some sort of resistance, to increase some sort of pressure. You know, like squeezing yeah, a hose you're, you're, with certain water, so yeah. you're making your lungs so push a little. Yeah, it probably mm-hmm. is worth saying that there's two, two things. It's my phone that happen, <laughs> uh, that that mess lungs up, mm-hmm. um, and the fibrosis thing is more a restrictive component. There's an obstructive component and a restrictive component. Okay, and so if you're thinking of like shoe level, leather, it's, it's not, not going to expand. Pliable. It's not going to yeah. yeah, yeah. So so this is just kind of general, like stretching beyond that mm-hmm. and trying to maximize your ability to take a very very deep breath in in a long slow way. Much like yoga. <laughs> exactly like yoga. Wow. Okay. So then the next thing is diaphragmatic breathing, also like yoga. One hand on the chest and one on the upper abdomen where the where the diaphragm is. So the <clears throat> the diaphragm <clears throat> is is a muscle that's in between that defines the chest cavity and the abdominal cavity. Right. Okay. So what you want to do <clears throat> is to make the diaphragm expand as much as possible, right? So you're gently resist you're gently resisting against that fibrotic lack of movement. So okay, okay. okay. So okay. to make the diaphragm expand, you're 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 breathing in. Yeah. Okay. So and with one hand on your chest and one hand on your upper abdomen, you kind of have an it brings your awareness to where your diaphragm is. You're Ooh, focusing your attention on a part. This is this is this is total yoga. Breathing yoga. Yeah. yeah. So the goal is to train the diaphragm to add to breathing out. Okay. okay. So it's to strengthen that muscle. And this actually has been shown to slow heart rate and stabilize blood pressure. Mm. Wow. Which yeah. is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. So the next one, really simple balloon exercise. So go to the dollar store. Spend a what is it a buck twenty five now? Yeah, um, get a little package of balloons, blow the balloon up in multiple slow breaths. Okay, bonus point because this also helps. This is the most effective way to treat eustachian tube dysfunction. Which you mean is pop in your ears? Pop, yeah, in your ears pop and not uh-huh. get filled up with fluid and be annoying. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So balloon exercises really slowly blow up the balloon in multiple slow breaths. Okay. The next one, like every kid in town knows, is the straw exercise. So it takes a straw in the mouth, one end's in the mouth, the other end's in a glass of water, and blow bubbles. Inhaling through the nose, blow bubbles in the water. Yeah, don't get that backwards. Yeah, that would be bad. (laughs) (laughs) So that's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. So that's I think what that's doing is the same thing. It's kind of the opposite thing, actually. You're trying to to prolong the, the blowing of the bubbles, and that's like 
like emptying your lungs completely. Right. So again, right. trying to work on pliability. And then my favorite I've been doing for the last two days since I read this is breath holding. Mm -hmm. So inhale through the nose, hold for five seconds, and exhale. Exhale doesn't matter through what? Yeah, mouth they, or nose? Preferred just mouth, but okay, they, yeah, it's, yeah. didn't specify it. And um, this, the woman who was demonstrating it on the YouTube video was like really basic about holding her fingers up and counting for five. <laughs> and, um, you know, so, but that's pretty straightforward. They also recommended spirometry, which involves, this is the only one that involves special equipment. Mm -hmm. But if somebody was in the hospital, they might have gotten a spirometry set. And that looks like it's usually sitting by the bedside. You get it oftentimes post-surgery. It looks like breathing into um, a tube, and then it goes to um, kind of a looks like a bowling alley with multiple parallel lanes, uh -huh. and there are little balls in there, and you make the little balls go up. And if you can make them all go up, uh -huh. and they let you home, go home. That so. is uh, 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 that's a scene in the right stuff. The movie about the uh, the astronauts, the first yeah. astronauts, yeah. and there was a breathing exercise, and right. there was a yeah. That's wow. Okay. Yeah. So it, apparently, you can buy that in pharmacy in any pharmacy if you didn't get it at the hospital. But I really don't think you need it. I don't. I think you could do the other stuff, and it would kind of accomplish this. This kind of thing. well, this sort of. I mean, this isn't so much an exercise as it, as it is a measurement, right? It's a little bit of a measurement. I think that there's an incentive component. Okay. So okay. if somebody's a little self. You know, competing. They want to do a little. You get bad. better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a way of actually the, seeing better. A personal better best. Like, yeah. yeah. So I just down the road. I want to plant this because we've talked about this is the like, the second week we've talked about the the equipment that you can have now in your home. Right. At some point, I'd like to just sort of trick out in in a health matters just oh, the cool. all yeah. the best equipment that you can have in your house, your own healthcare sort of equipment right. because there's a lot more available now than than I think I was ever aware and, of. And it's actually pretty cheap. Stuff mm -hmm. used to be really expensive. Right. Is pulse boxes through this probably went down to 20 bucks each oh wow so wow. that okay. used to be like don't lose that don't yeah. take that home it's don't 100 bucks <laughs> no no they don't care so so these sets are to be done three times a day with two sets each and as according to the studies i read improvement is quick so all of this okay. is really easy mm -hmm. here's what i found really really interesting with this is that India had the big problem with Delta. Mm -hmm. It did a lot of damage to people's lungs. I thought it was really great that the, their you know, health care system there made this available in a really simple, a really data-driven, and essentially free way. Mm -hmm. And then when, you, when you're reading American journals about the importance of it, it doesn't really tell you how to do it. It's like a proprietary secret. Wow. Are they hoping that you'll go see a specialist for this? Yeah, I could see that somebody could get sent to a pulmonologist mm -hmm. or, you know, if somebody lived in San Francisco and maybe there was an outpatient respiratory therapy thing available. I mean, we just went over this in, what, seven minutes or And these are, are super They're easy super, and doable exercises. I think at the bottom line, this is what they would tell you, mm -hmm. stuff like this. And, and then charge you a thousand dollars for your own uh, spir spir spirometer. <laughs> is that yeah, what that is? I don't even think. And I would say I don't. I don't even think you need a spirometer. Right, right. I think right. Um, if I was doing this, I would look at my improvement by how I felt. Mm -hmm. Less anxiety, um, less rapid heart rate, maybe less shortness of breath, less dyspnea on exertion, or losing your breath when you move around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So more energy. I find it. I want to get back into uh, the differences and how you found this with, uh, uh, you know, with, with basically Indian videos on YouTube right. from India. The, uh, um, but again, I just when you were going through these exercises, it seems like almost all of them are 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 designed to to create some sort of resistance for your lungs to push against gently, right? Like that. And that, yeah, I mean, I've I've known this from exercising and working out for thirty years now. Is that Lung, lungs are very quick to 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 recoup. It's not like working an ordinary quote unquote muscle. Right. They're 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 they can become much more efficient quickly. Right. They respond to to all sorts of things perhaps faster than any other system I've ever right. experienced. So, so I can see all that's really really interesting and so simple. But essentially, I mean, anything if you're having to deal with this and you and you want to increase the lung function, pulmonary function, and 
you're basically just stretching your lungs. There's almost, you can come up with any sort of thing that just kind of creates that sort of resistance and just slowly push against it with your lungs, right? Right. Yeah. Like, like walking into Redwoods, but picking a trail that has some uphills. Right. So this isn't yeah. like rocket surgery. Why, why can't you find this readily available in America? Why can't you find this information? I, I think it goes back... To my one of my pet peeves with medicine is I don't think that providers tell patients really um, productive things to do that they what they can do for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it, you know, we they patients oftentimes are kind of passive mm -hmm. in it, and they, but I think they're made to be passive, and and they're totally willing. And what I find is they're totally willing to learn if you give them something practical. Yeah. So like my thing with people who chose to be unvaccinated is I checked their vitamin D levels and then made sure they had vitamin D and they were all over that. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah and talk so, about. But, but I don't think that that happens a lot, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, you know, I, I kind of strive in, at least in my practice for the practical and this is really super practical. So I don't know. I don't know why medicine... Sometimes I feel if I practice medicine, I don't know how to explain it. The way I'm taught to, mm -hmm. then I'm like a traffic cop. You go to respiratory therapy, you go get this x-ray done. Maybe we should do a CT scan on you. How about drawing blood on you? And and I'm not telling people really practical stuff. Here's hmm. a perfect example for eustachian tube dysfunction. There are five things that are commonly recommended and four of them don't work, and one of them does. Really? And the thing that works <laughs> is blowing up balloons. Uh -huh. um, and and it takes a while. You have to do it um, like three times a day for two or three weeks, maybe two a month, before mm -hmm. you decide it's either helping or not helping. But if you say that to a patient, because they're kind of trained, like, okay, set me up with some antihistamines and some decongestants, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are known not to work, oh, wow. but are so commonly recommended. So if you tell somebody, hey, go down to the dollar store, splurge, get a pack of balloons, you know, and do this two or three times a day, there's two groups of people. There's one, one group will look at you and go, what? balloons <laughs> like really <laughs> and then the other group is utterly delighted it's about mm -hmm. 50 50 like i don't have to take medicine for this well and i'm giving something right. practically that i can go do and feel like right. i'm addressing the issue myself as well right so i think there's very few moments like that why that in the exam room what is it what is it about the 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 I guess the the psychodynamic of our of our healthcare culture in the United States that's done that. I mean, I can understand people being passive because I, when I go to the doctor, I sort of give up everything. Right. Like you know best. I know right. nothing. Right. You can see inside my body. Right. I have no clue what's going on. So I will sit back and defer. Right. But if that doctor isn't stepping up and and giving their most to that right. dynamic, then I don't know. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think. Um, I think a lot of healthcare providers forget why they love medicine, right? Because there's cool things like that, uh -huh, uh -huh. and um, so I, I actually think investing in cool things is a way to um, you know relieve burnout. I think computers burn doctors out. I think they forget to talk to patients, mm -hmm. and I think providers. I'm not just talking about doctors, but um, providers in general train patients not to ask questions, not to push back against what they're being told. Okay. Okay, I could sort of see that as a follow along with that whole dynamic I just described right. about giving up all power in that situation right. to the all knowing because, doctor. Because you're quote unquote an easier patient mm -hmm. if you don't ask questions. Sure, sure. Right. And so, um, well, then because I, don't know. I like it, to draw on table paper and I, I don't know, make, <laughs> I, I just find that this brings stuff to my practice. Uh huh. What and brings that stuff? What do you mean? Is, is, being able to give somebody really practical suggestions or a practical explanation. Mm -hmm. Here's a perfect example. Dr. Riley, who is the optometrist at UHS, just examined my eyes. And I have kind of a weird thing where I have a, I have my glasses or one lens is within my right eye. Okay, because I had a cat cataract remove and I had a lens put in instead of just a you know neutral lens. I had it fit to my my visual need and my wow. astigmatism. And what it. if your visual need changes over time? Um, then you can wear glasses. Oh, but gotcha. It, okay, it corrected okay, okay, an okay. astigmatism, which is a pretty stable anyway. Okay. And so 
and I don't have that in my other eye. And because of that, I have real problems with it. And I have regret that I have it. Mm. And he goes, okay, here's what's wrong. And he's drawing pictures and stuff. He's talking to me like I understand, you know, uh -huh. the words and stuff. And and it was like he was the first doctor in probably 10 years who actually understood my complaint uh -huh. Do you, and you, addressed it practically. Would you have, would you have gotten that same that same treatment uh, had you been a lay person and not another healthcare person? Was this like a, a you know a professional courtesy? Let me draw you a picture. Or well, was he, it? Yeah, he was aware that I was his colleague because right. the office down the hall. But um, <laughs> but I also think he's but he was into it. Okay? okay, okay, okay. So I didn't feel like he was just placating me. Sure, he was into it because plenty of people before I knew I'm a PA mm -hmm. and they placated me. Okay, or they okay. didn't really answer the question, or somehow they got involved in another thing. Mm -hmm. Like usually the com entering data in the computer or something like that. Is it just that, that every interaction has been commodified every interaction yes is that what it is that is it that's uh, that's absolutely what i think because then there there there's pressures then on everyone involved to move to the next move to the next patient and get that out and right. get that person well that's out. part of the reason we have um the electronic health records mm -hmm. is that every, every key stro uh, stroke is recorded yeah so yeah. everything you do and it's all defined you work up templates so and getting a history, getting what's called a review of systems. That's where your provider's asking you all kinds of questions that are irrelevant to your visit. Right. Just those, getting the bigger those, picture. Yeah. If, no, it's, not. it's you, not. You get more money if you have more of those questions answered. Yeah. You're shocked. He's doing the covering of his face. Really? With his hand in shock. Re there, are dollar, yeah. there are dollar signs attached to the questions that they ask? Yes. To the screening that you have to undergo? Yes. Yes, and then the vitals, and then the um, the what's called the um, the ob uh, objective part of the note, which is the physical exam. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's in a template, and that's like if you're using a template, it's kind of like wearing somebody else's underwear. Right, right, because right. they're not really looking at the things that you were trained to look at, but you have to hit the you have to hit their bullet points because that's how you're paid. And so what I and what most older providers do is we go to the comment section and we write all the things that are really important medically. Uh -huh. But there's a there's a limit on the number of characters you can do. It's insanely low. It's oh like two hundred or something. Oh my god! Right. Uh, basically, a tweet length is what you have right. then to do. Right. And I'm appalled. And they don't they don't want you using it because it doesn't bring any any monetary value to the exam. But anyway, I think that's so. I um, would, I would, yeah, we just, should talk about this sometimes. I, I want to just, yep, just really briefly for me, for okay. my own sake. Okay, so so you go in to see a, a PA, uh, uh, what's the other one, a nurse practitioner? A, 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 a physician. A, a physician, thank you. Yeah. I was going to say a doctor, no. regular old doctor. Um, I guess I never thought about how healthcare people were paid. Like what were the price points basically? Yeah, it's not us being paid. It's it's the bill. It's the organization we work for. So like open so like door Blend, UIHS. Yeah, that's like the that, organization. Right? Maybe Blundell. It maybe it's him. You could argue it's him personally because right. he's pretty much his only show. So 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 these questions, the screening that you have to that that that, that they put you through, right? But they uh, train you so, incessantly. So if you if they don't do that. Then that changes the amount of money that they get for this visit. Yeah. So then the next thing in a note is that you write, you write a um, diagnosis. Now, we used to be able to write, you know, somebody has chest pain, rule out, you know, does he, this is person have pulmonary embolism? Does this person, you know, just fell in the bathtub and has a bruise on their chest wall? Does this person having a heart attack? Does this person have GERD or um, esophageal reflux, which is heartburn? Um, and if you type something in, you not only can you not use the rule out thing, the rule out thing doesn't exist. Which the rule is, out thing, what's, what's the rule out rule thing? The rule out thing is, it is you start with like a more general thing and then you, and the, when you're writing a chart note, 
um, like by hand mm-hmm. on a piece of paper. You're, you're actually rule out is your process of, well, I didn't think it was a heart attack because of this. Gotcha. I didn't think it was heartburn because of this. And I didn't think it was, but I'm not sure about this. So mm-hmm. I'm going to think about this some more and maybe get some more information going in this direction to yeah. clarify this diagnosis. Okay. You, what it does is it, audit, it doesn't give you a rule out option. So that whole part, that whole most important thing about medical thought mm-hmm. is Poof, what do you like have gone. instead then? You you just get like a generic, um, you know, like low back pain is mm-hmm. oftentimes um, just called lumbago, which just means low back pain. Uh huh. So there's there's no next step in, in deeper understanding about what's really going on with somebody. Do you get that? They're just check. They're just checking things off a list then, as opposed right. to as opposed and to following it, reasoning. It changes the diagnosis. If, it, if you call it one thing, then the computer and looking for the number uh-huh. because it's all numerically uh-huh. driven uh-huh. is kind of changes it. And so somebody reading the chart note later is going to say, well, why didn't they think maybe he was having a heart attack? Well, of course they thought that, you know? Right, but, right, right. But they couldn't describe that. So then you get back to writing little paragraphs in the comment section that only limits you to... Yeah, in the ER, they call that, that thought process a disposition, and they do have um, a way to do that in the electronic medical record in the ER, but not in family practice. And so you're like reinventing the wheel each time you see the patient. Well, then they've taken like the system in, in, in order to be uh, uh, consistent, and a system has taken just the right. human out of all of right. it. Right, so somebody who knew nothing about medicine, mm-hmm. but maybe lots about computer programming, Put their version of medicine and right, uh, right. defined it. Wow. And it's really and, frustrating. And then attached monetary value to, to it. In different parts of it. Right. Oh my God. And that's that's why we're that's why oftentimes we get in the room and we're looking at the chart note and looking at you and confused. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Because we don't remember the you know, the beautiful details that would have defined your problem. Right. And that's why Patients go in, let's say a patient comes in with a sore throat, then they get diagnosed as pharyngitis. So what does that really mean in medicine? A sore, sore throat. throat. <laughs> so is that a step forward? Right. I don't right. think so. Uh-uh. You know, so, you know, it used to be able to rule out strep, rule out mono, rule out allergies, rule out, and you, you, that whole layer of in, important information right. is just poof. Gone. So there's no incentivization to understand the causes behind anything. All you're doing is documenting current status all and then administering care for those All things. you're doing is making a billable encounter. It's there even go. worse than that. There you go. Right. And if that, yeah. But if that billable, oh, say you've got pharyngitis, you've got a sore throat, instead of understanding why you have a sore throat, right. here's a prescription, here's medication, here's what you get. We right. charge for this interaction. You get charged for this medication. Everybody right. makes money. Nobody understands the underlying reason. Yeah, and then condition. you come back next Tuesday because your throat still hurts. And, right. And you see a different person. And go you, through the you same go, thing. They said I had pharyngitis. <laughs> and, and, the, and the new provider goes. It's lumbago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's ridiculous. And that, Yeah, anyway, we could go on and on about that. ICD-10 that, we, are really awful. We should go on and on about that. And we should all be going on and on about that. Because that's it's it, that whole dynamic, the way we've set our healthcare system up, is why you find more usable knowledge, practical knowledge on YouTube from India about what we were talking about today than you can find here in the United States. Right, and it's important knowledge. So anybody that w- was able to jot it down mm-hmm. because they or their loved one have this particular problem, I I believe that this could be really practical and significant help. Wow. So that's. You know, that's why I'm talking about blowing bubbles with a straw, even mm-hmm. though it seems like, what? Um, yeah. No, 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 no. The way the lungs work, that makes perfect sense. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <sighs> the other thing, too, I want to add, the last like little Q- off-topic thing What, a I cure for add. capitalism? What do you have for us here to wrap up? What is going on? <laughs> I'm not seeing anybody put acute COVID in the problem list. There's a part of the electronic medical records called a problem list, and that's actually helpful. And so it's like, I know when you had athlete's foot when you were six, you know, okay. so I can, I can drop in and get all that information. But because people are kind of diagnosed with acute COVID, probably saw a nurse, probably went home, let's say they had a mild case and they just kind of got better on their own. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't really make it into the body of the medical chart. And so things with 
acute COVID, especially if somebody's unimmunized, so another good reason to get immunized if you needed more, um, is that, that the possibility of having a blood clot over the next three months goes up, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. The possibility of having a problem with certain medications or, or, or lab tests being confusing goes up. Mm -hmm. The possibility of an otherwise healthy kid reporting for their sports physical and actually having a problem that will go unnoticed mm -hmm. goes up. So make sure that you tell the provider, like if you're a mom and you're bringing in three kids for well child checks, if you guys all had COVID like last August after the fair, right, say something. Right. Because it, that changes the way we take care of people. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be in kind of in perpetuity, I imagine. And right now there's no checkbox on the on the there electronic form none. for acute COVID. Wow. No, okay. Okay. it's kind of lost in the bowels of an electronic mess. Huh. Really, it's really hard to find. So make sure that that gets noted and ask that it be put in the problem list. Okay. 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 No, nothing bad will happen to you as a patient. Okay. Only good. And for anybody who wants to find uh, the, uh, the the steps that you've uh, the, the pulmonary uh, uh, rehab here that you've talked mm -hmm. about, uh, searching on YouTube for what would be the best phrase? What would be the best key phrase to, to search for? I just for? looked at pul for pulmonary rehabilitation for COVID. That's exactly and the I, first line in your email here: yeah. pulmonary rehabilitation after COVID. So yeah. search that. And yeah. See. Huh. And um, it should be very practical. I would drop into a site that has practical stuff. There's probably. You know, there's probably sites that are more user friendly than others, mm -hmm. but the ones I found that were the best were came out of India. So yay, India! Right on. Yeah. Ah well, the sun still never sets on universal health care. Yeah, we tried John <laughs> Ware and we had belly flopped. Remember we talked about it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Seduced yeah. and abandoned, we were. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, and on that note, thank <laughs> you, thank you for this week's health matters, Lynn. Any idea what next week will look like? No, I'm sure there'll be something. I'm waiting for I'm waiting for son of Omicron. Because oh, yeah, now we're do. pretending that COVID's not a thing anymore. Dun, pretending? Dun, dun, what do you mean dun, pretending? Dun, dun, dun. Well, no masks. <laughs> I went to a restaurant the other day. <laughs> I tried to go to a movie, but I just honestly couldn't handle it. Really? Were you yeah. like, nope, nope, I don't want to do this? Yeah, the JC basketball tournament happened this weekend. You're oh. probably aware of that, huh? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Well, traditionally, that brings us strep throat, mononucleosis, and one memorable year gonorrhea. So, without getting into that into too much detail, I want. I'm. I'm wondering if the COVID. <laughs> but how would we know? Hank Sims took the took the data off his uh, Floco. So. Off the low. Uh, off the low. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah Hank, well, well, bring it back. We're not done yet, Hank. <sighs> no. No. We're done. It's all better. Everything's fine. <laughs> Here's your money. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ka -ching, ka -ching. Oh, health uh, health matters with PA Lindsay. Well, Lynn, thank you so very much. We'll have a, another health matters for you next week here on KFUG. Thanks.